Hello, welcome to High Road U. We're delighted to, that you are taking your valuable time to join us. We welcome you to Holiday Inbox Basics with Jenny Lassie from High Road Solution. If you are currently dialed into the telephone conference, remember this is a toll number, but if you have a voice over IP connection on your computer, please hang up and click mic and speakers under the audio panel on the right side of your screen. Supporting materials for today's presentation have been made available to you to print or download. You may access materials by clicking the materials panel on the right side of your screen. Presenters encourage questions, so please ask when prompted by clicking the, channel pan the chat panel and typing in your question. Our content leaders will try and incorporate in your questions during the session, but will address them during the Q&A portion at the end of the session. Please also remember that High Road Solution is an authorized provider of CAE credits. You are only available or eligible to report this webinar for a CAE credit if you attend live and for the entire session. Our, ses our session is eligible for one CAE credit. At this time, it is my pleasure to turn the program over to your presenter, Jenny Lassie. Ms. Lassie, please begin. Thank you, Jennifer. This is Jenny Lassie from High Road Solution. Welcome today to the High Road Solution pre-holiday inbox uh, presentation. So we did a similar presentation last year um, at this time, but you know, as cycles change with email marketing, um, so does the best practices and suggestions that we will make. I have been with High Road Solution for eight years, first as a client and then as an employee. And so I, my primary focus is handling uh, deployments with the deliverability with wide range of clients. Um, obviously, I'm the data and delivery, deliverability person here at High Road. Um, that is my primary focus. You reaching the inbox is my primary goal. And so I approach everything from that perspective. So um, I also consult with clients on authentication, content, content strategy, email preference center management, and other deliverability optimization tactics. So today's content, we're going to go over ISPs and deliverability, the five C's of email marketing. We're going to talk about engagement and have a Q4 fundraising case study, and as well as some shortcuts, the high road recipe, and resources. So to begin, why do ISPs change deliverability algorithms pre-holiday, and how does it affect your organization? Well, there's a big reason for that. Um, the holiday season has already begun. It began in late August. Um, and continues to plague email marketers uh, really in all of Q4, but, but it's going to, you're going to really start seeing a, an impact um, on you uh, starting now, if it hasn't already, uh, if you haven't already noticed differences in your bounce rates and invalid rates um, when you are sending your organization's email. Because it's basically it's back to school time, and, and you know, um, it's also that time of year's or a time of year that ISPs, they have to make their inbox algorithms more restrictive because there's such a flux and massive amounts of emails coming through their networks. They, they have to uh, make it more difficult to reach um, because really their end goal is to um, keep their customers' inboxes manageable, right? And if they get a lot of complaints, they have to manage those complaints. And so they're really responding to the needs of the actual end recipient, because that's their customer. Um, so an important question is, what is spam? Like real spam. Not the stuff that you signed up for last year but and are sick of reading, so you kind of mentally opted out and you just keep deleting them without reading them. I mean real spam where you did not sign up for something directly or indirectly through affiliates without reading the fine print about what you're signing up for. Um, regardless if it's real spam or perceived spam, the inbox owner can hit the this is spam button and your headaches as an email marketer begin. So we at High Road, we understand that in the association space, you're not out there marketing products um, you know, that people want to buy for the holidays. I mean, you might, you might be, but that's really not your primary goal. And we know from the aggregated statistics from all of our association partners and clients that there is a dip in deliverability during this time. It's because basically the Q4 curse, I call it, 
um, it's ramping up for the holiday email season. And um, what if your membership campaigns require you to ramp up your volume to drive membership goals at the same time ISPs are getting more restrictive? This might be striking a chord with you because so many associations have their Q4, their last uh, year-end conversion goals. You're trying to convert more memberships from maybe some free memberships, or you're trying to convert uh, people to upgrade to a paid membership. Um, so there's there's a lot of associations doing this right now, and it and it's it's tricky because the inboxes are so much more hard to get to this time of year. At the same time, you're sending more email, and and it's more of the um, quote unquote blast mentality. You're trying to reach the most possible people versus best practices for Q4 and being more restrictive and more segmented of who you're sending these emails to. Sending emails to a wide or trying to cast the widest net is the last thing you should be doing in Q4. Um, unfortunately, it just happens to be the reality that you want to reach out to as many um, prospect members as you possibly can during that time so you're sending to you know, bad email addresses or email addresses that have not been um, guaranteed valid in the last six months. And so that causes more bounces and contributes um, to lower deliverability. All right. So what can you do now to stay inboxed in Q4 2014? So my, my kind of song and dance is the five C's of email marketing strategy. So configuration, uh, so basically cleaning the house, content, create, criticize, and continue. So the, the first step in, in the five C's is configuration. So this, this should be a primary, this is the foundation for your house. This is where everybody needs to start before hitting that send button because Honestly, if you're just sending without doing these very simple things that do not take a lot of time at all or really any IT resources, they're very simple. I don't want them to sound scary. Um, I'm not a, a super duper technical person, but this makes total sense to me. It's very easy. We can help you out. If you're a high road customer, we can help you out. Any other uh, email service provider is also able to help you out with these types of things. If you just ask the question, they'd be able to answer you uh, very quickly. All right, so an IP address, so a dedicated or shared IP. Um, you're probably using one or the other. If you know, if you have a higher sending volume, then you probably might have your own dedicated IP. And what that means is that you have one IP address associated with your email account, and that IP address is where all of your traffic is coming from. Um, you are responsible for your own email uh, reputation destiny, if you will. If you're on a shared IP, it's basically one IP address, but you know there's other like-minded associations that are kind of in this pool with you. Um, and what you do can potentially affect what other people do. So if you are sending to a, a big list of, of you know non-engaged Yahoo subscribers and uh, you get blocked at Yahoo, that can affect your uh, other associations that are also on that shared IP that could be now getting blocked on Yahoo because of something that um, your organization did. So IP address uh, management, uh, you're probably already using um, uh, you know, one or the other. So um, DKIM, D or DKIM, basically is an authentication technology that uh, authenticates or is a digital signature that your domain has permission to send email on your behalf, right? Most, if not all, ISPs are going to be looking at either DKIM or sender ID um, or a combination of both, okay? It's best practices. It's something it's not a nice to have anymore. It's absolutely a must have if you want to reach inboxes. For instance, if you have Gmail subscribers in your database, you will not reach them if you do not have DKIM enabled today. Okay, right to spam, right to spam, which is just throwing money away. So I highly recommend doing that. It's really as simple as you know, getting a, a little a little um, string of text and have you know, giving it to your IT department to to put on your DNS. It connects your email account 
to your domain and authenticates, um, authenticates your domain. Okay. So we at High Road, um, we have deliverability cops, basically. So we are monitoring our customers' IP addresses and shared IP addresses. And so if any of our customers have a dedicated IP, we're looking on a daily basis of any activity against that IP that could be affecting what's called a, a, a sender score, right? So it's a sender score is, is a advisory um, number that is directly could be directly affecting your email campaigns. So, for instance, a, um, a score of 51 out of 100 is right in the medium risk category and could be um, could be causing a lot of bounces that, that are not necessarily, um, you know, bounces that you want, right? They're, you're, they're your members. They're your membership. They're people that signed up to receive your emails. Well, if you, if you have a lower center score and their filters are looking at reputation, which they are, that you could be getting bounced. So it's, it's your um, duty to always be cognizant of what your center score is. But if, you know, for any of our customers, we do monitor this uh, for them. If their scores are dipping, I'll, basically it'll prompt us uh, to reach out to our customer and say, hey, notice that um, your sender score is dropping for reasons A, B, and C. Um, here's what we recommend, right? And so um, for a dedicated IP, it's like we look at senders rejected, messages filtered, a lot of unknown users being introduced to your data so we can tell if uh, maybe there's a third-party list of people that have been imported into your account. Uh, we can take a look at infrastructure and see if the TKIM and, and um, SPF record pass. We take a look at the volume, uh, spam traps, which are a big um, thing to worry about in Q4, blacklists, complaints, uh, feedback loops, complaints, basically um, feedback loops, complaints, feedback loops, complaints are routed directly to your opt-out database if you're using any of our platforms. Um, you know, if you're using another platform, then it's possible that um, you just receive a, an email uh, to abuse at or postmaster at whatever your domain is, and then they will, um, you know, it prompts you to, to spring into action and, and cleanse your data. Okay, and on a shared IP, we have a little bit more uh, limited uh, access to you know what what's going on. Like for instance, if there are spam traps, we're seeing spam traps as a whole for all all of our customers on uh, that particular shared IP. We can't tell if the spam trap is uh, in you know Association A's database versus versus Association B that are on a shared IP. Um, so what we do look at and focus on uh, specifically are complaints because we can, we can see if there are a number of complaints coming from an organization on a shared IP that we do recommend moving on to, to a dedicated IP or moving you to a, to a different IP address. Okay, so for the authentication piece, like I said, it's just a, it's a few little uh, snippets of text. So if you can see in the screenshot below, um, it's a basically text that's in a text file. We supply it to you and you give that to um, IT or whomever has access to the DNS, um, and they can just simply add those text records. You let us know once those are added, and uh, we flip the switch. Okay. Now, before I get into content, um, I wanted to get into engagement. Um, you know, only sending to known good or valid email addresses, even if you're not sure if the emails are valid and if it's been longer than six months that you've, you know, sent to that email address, we highly suggest using an email validation service before you do that. So I think it's really important for associations. I know a lot of times they don't want to take the time um, and, and incur the cost for an email validation service, but it really, it's a kind of a wash because the amount of the report um, actually is going to save you that amount of money in emails that you would have sent, right? You actually probably um, won't see a difference in it, but for the data hygiene aspect of it, 
it's going to get you a long ways in delivering to the inbox versus contributing to the negative reputation of your domain or IP address. Okay, and only sending to emails to engage subscribers that regularly receive emails and open and click, you know, basically open and click through to them. You know, we want you to send as many emails as possible uh, for membership campaigns, but uh, casting the widest net does not mean higher engagement. It actually means higher bounces and lower engagement. So uh, you will need to come to terms with excluding non-engaged subscribers and a smaller list um, and changing your membership campaign uh, maybe to after the holidays or accept the fact that your email reputation will take a little bit of a dip if you proceed without changing the way you normally launch emails at this time, at least in, in Q4. So just some aggravated stats that, uh, from association metrics from our industry benchmark study that's available to our clients in the High Road customer uh, support portal. But in Q4, um, the average delivered is 96.91%, and the average bounce is 2.85%. The average invalid rate is 0.46%. So basically, that's a decrease of 1.28% from Q3 averages on delivered. It's an increase of 0.9% from Q3 averages on bounces um, from Q3. So for an association that may send um, like an average of a million messages a month, that's about 38,400 less emails delivered that they paid for. That is 28,500 more emails in the bounce logs that they paid for and people aren't getting. And that's 13,800 email addresses resolved to invalid because they were no longer deliverable. And that could have been because they bounced too many times, because you didn't have DKIM um, set up, or, or there could be a few other things contributing to, it, to an additional bounce. But these stats are from associations just like you. Um, these are also associations that are using DKIM. Uh, and sender ID, and some, in some cases also DMARC authentication. And they're adhering to best practices. So your metrics may vary depending on your list hygiene, your use of authentication, and sending frequency. Um, complaints registered against the email will lower your sender score and email reputation, and that will extend into Q1 of the following year. So, all right. Okay, and there's also more than just your sender score or IP reputation contributing to your deliverability. There's also um, basically all domains used in the from email address, and if there's authentication, okay, all links and URLs used in the body of your email, and this is an important one because I, I hear this a lot in support. Um, if anyone has reported the domains or link as a spamvertised web page or reported that web page blacklisted, if you even use that URL in one of your emails, it counts against you. Okay, so I highly recommend running the URLs that you're going about to use in an email, especially if they're going to, um, you know, third parties or maybe even um, advertisers, right? So you might have advertisers or sponsors uh, links in your email that are linking to their site, but if their site has been, um, people have reported that as a spam advertised site, it counts against you. Um, so just be careful in, in your content. So basically all content counts towards your sender score and IP reputation. In all systems sending email on your behalf and their reputation. Um, count towards your reputation. So any CRM solution that you might use for sending email, so basically, you know, any Salesforce or, or, you know, things along those lines. ESPs, so any other systems you might be sending uh, email with. Corporate email, marketing email, transaction emails from, you know, whatever transaction platform um, you're using if you are, you know, sending out um, uh, receipts or you know webinar registration uh, type uh, triggered emails that sort of thing the reputation of that it all counts towards you it's an aggregate against your reputation so it's not just the IP address and that contributes to your reputation from your from your um, you know third-party email platform it's everything that counts against it so especially in Q4 you have to take a look at all of these aspects um, because it does affect you 
And also, um, I would advise to keeping the, any complaint rates lower this time of year. Complaints are basically the number of spam complaints divided by the total number of emails sent. Anything less than 0.3% is acceptable. Anything higher than that, uh, you are going to see uh, a lot of deliverability issues. And how can you tell your complaint rate? Most platforms, um, at least I know the platforms, uh, the high road platforms, we do have um, the ability to export opt-outs. And you can tell if you include an additional field in that opt-out export that's called um, opt-out source, it will tell you the source. And if it says complaint report, it's because somebody reported you as a spammer. They hit the this is spam button. And, and if you have a high percentage of those, um, I, other ISPs take notice. So, okay. And other measurements do that contribute to, the, to deliverability. Um, the HTML markup using best practices, bounces from address, complaint rate, engagement, content, phishing, spam traps, virus content, reverse DNS, sending an organization, any hidden text that might be in your email. Most people don't do that anymore, but some people do. Um, if they want to you know, have any hidden text in there, maybe it's white text on a white background. Um, IP address and, and any malicious code that could be in your HTML because you might have pasted from uh, a word into an HTML editor or something. Um, all right, so the five C's, the next step, content. Um, it does count, okay? There aren't as many content filters now in place uh, on email servers, but there still are, okay? So especially during this time, um, there's a lot of email coming coming through that have you know the word sale or percentage off or you know blowout liquidation that that type of thing. Okay, you want to stay clear of that if you have it in the content of your email, um, just minimal use of exclamation points. Um, you know, some people say some people's filters say okay one's acceptable but two is too many, right? And it'll start to filter those out. So. Um, make sure that your subject lines and preheaders uh, make minimal use of uh, what could be considered a spam type content. Okay, have a clear call to action. Um, that is, you know, a very concise email that says exactly uh, the information you want and tells them exactly what you want them to do, and has a clear area of that website that they can click or you know click to learn more or uh, click a button to to get to that call to action so something very clear um, heat map studies they show like the upper left is where people's eyes goes to first um, so you know you could put it up there um, and if you have any questions about maybe um, the way you are setting up your email and if and if those things are clear just you know reach out to, to high road I mean that that's what we're here for to, to help you get the, the most bang for your buck. Also adding a table of contents for skimmers for your newsletters, um, I think this is a must. Uh, simply people, if, if you have a lot of content in your emails, you want to keep it less is more, honestly. Um, you now more text to, and less graphic is, is, is fine. Um, filters don't like to see a ton of graphics, especially if your uh, graphic to text ratio means that your entire email is a graphic, um, not best practices. We highly recommend you not doing that versus having more text actually in the email and less uh, actual graphic. You can have background colors in, in your HTML emails too, and that, that kind of gives the look and feel of having more graphic elements without there being actual images, so. Okay. And then creation. So, I'm sure you've all heard of responsive and adaptive email um, design, as well as web page design, right? Now, they're coded differently. Uh, email is a little bit behind the times when it comes to web pages, because email needs inline styles. You can't reference a style sheet uh, using cascading style sheets like you can for a web page, so everything needs to be coded inline. Now, that's done in a very specific way. Um, if you have 
uh, a template you want made responsive. It, sometimes it works with the, with the design, sometimes it doesn't, sometimes your design needs to change. But basically, it's, it's an email template that flexes to whatever screen size your recipients are receiving your email. If they're looking at their iPhone, it's flexing down and stacking things um, so, it's, so they're better displayed on your iPhone. So you're not looking at an entire two-column email newsletter and all the images are just shrunk down. Um, it's actually responding to that. And sometimes it can increase the size of an image, like, uh, like a button, to make it um, you know, uh, like a knuckle tap to, to click through to that. So. And then also a segmented list. Um, think smarter, not larger. And for Q4, I can't stress this enough, casting the widest net does not work. It doesn't work in general. I'm, I'm always a fan of being more segmented. You are going to prove to your boss that you have better open rates when you are more targeted with your segmentation. Okay? No, look at your data, know a little bit about them, know how to group them, know how to speak to them and don't cast the widest net to, with content that's supposed to just you know, kind of resonate with everybody because it doesn't exist, honestly. Um, you need to speak to them at a segmented level, especially in Q4 when it's harder to reach an inbox. Engagement matters. Okay? And we also, um, when you do create, you need to suppress your non-openers beyond uh, 90 days is the recommendation. That's where to start. Okay? I have been... Um, doing consulting for a few clients and actually even being as su suppressing non-openers beyond 30 days was necessary for them to cut out some of the spam traps that they kept hitting, okay, that was causing um, all kinds of blacklisting. So you sometimes need to be more restrictive. Um, I like to always have people start at 90 days. Uh, now, this is kind of always best practice, even not in Q4, even not during the holiday season, to suppress non-openers uh, beyond 180 days, so beyond six months, but 90 days especially um, during the holidays. Okay? Then following your campaign, you need to criticize the performance. Okay? So many people just, they're so focused on sending, once it's sent, they don't spend a lot of time taking a look at it to understand, okay, what worked, what didn't work, what do we need to be doing in the future. Um, so you need to be looking at and analyzing the different deliverability metrics, the bounces, the opens, and the clicks. Okay, the bounce logs are there for a reason. There's so much data available in those, the bounce codes and the bounce reasons. You can actually see visually what the server chatter is. What is their server telling our servers? Because basically it's just, at the end of the day, it's servers talking to servers. It's, it's nothing against you personally as an organization, but if something looks like spam and they bounce it, they're going to tell you why. It could be a spam, a spam content. Um, if it's a spam block or a mail block, then obviously those are things you want to take, um, take into consideration because those mail blocks will potentially invalidate some of your subscribers. So. Um, you also want to isolate subscribers who are not engaged with your email, so no opens and no clicks um, from that particular email. And, and I say this um, uh, with stressing, okay? After the holidays, you can create a win-back campaign for the non-engaged subscribers, okay? So you're not necessarily going to be um, taking them out altogether, okay? Just for this period of time when... The, ISPs are more restrictive, suppress, 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 not engaged. But after the holidays, then you can develop a win-back campaign to try and reach them and get them re-engaged in your programs, okay, in Q1. Um, but never, ever do that during the holidays because yeah, you're reaching out to people that are not engaging. ISPs are looking at that as just, just going to contribute to um, lower deliverability, okay. Analyze how many subscribers opt down or unsubscribe from particular messages. Um, if the perceived value of your content is low, that is really helpful information because maybe you are putting a lot of energy and resources into creating content that no one wants, right? And how often are you actually asking your recipients or, or your members what they do want, what's important to them? So we have 
um, Cairo has created a, a new Newsletter Express Plus model that is actually hyper-personalizing these emails, so much so that the open rate is through the roof. So the more segmented, the more engagement. Okay. And then the um, 5C continue. So basically, use what you've learned and apply it to your future deployments. So if, you, if you're not measuring, you are not really getting the full impact of, of what you're doing. You, you need to measure your, you know, take a look at your metrics and, and do what works and discontinue doing things that don't work. And then I, I, I threw a little bonus C in here. So the Q4 cut. You must suppress your non-engaged subscribers during this period. Cut them out. Just cut them out. Q1, you can worry about a win-back campaign, trying to um, get them re-interested in, in your brand or, or your content. But for right now, for Q4, cut them out. So basically, you know, if you're, if you're um, suppressing, I just want to um, put one caveat in there, right? Because you don't want to necessarily cut out anyone that maybe has just signed up and hasn't had a chance to open up one of your emails yet. So you definitely want to segment um, down to non-openers, but that have um, not joined your account beyond a certain day. So if you want to say, I want to um, suppress anyone that hasn't opened um, at least one email in the past 90 days, but um, you also want to drag in the criteria that the date joined um, is beyond 90 days in the past. So basically, that's going to take out anybody that maybe hasn't had a chance to open up and, and interact with one of your emails before they're uh, suppressed. So that's that's just an important note here. Okay. All right. So say you're ready to send. Now what? Um, the hype stay hyper focused on engagement. There are a number of tactics tactics that you can take to increase member engagement. Obviously, um, only sending to the engaged subscribers or constituents that have opened your email in the past 90 days. Uh, the big picture, uh, posterity of your, of your membership. So take a look at that. Granular, granular level. <clears throat> I need more coffee today. Uh, <laughs> increase your sender score, basically. Um, so do all of these tactics to increase your reputation and achieve higher engagement with strategic e-marketing. So what is strategic e-marketing? Uh, good question. So you're creating a specific message for a specific audience to elicit a specific response. That really is the simplicity and beauty of it. Um, as email marketers, that's what everyone can strive to do. Um, and I, I stress for a specific audience during Q4 because um, being more segmented will get you an open rate, um, a higher open rate than if you were to cast, uh, you know, basically a wider net. And then the click call to action rules of engagement, motivation, ability, and a trigger. Okay? So know what motivates, and this comes with segmentation too. You have to know what motivates each segment of your membership. If you don't know, you need to find out. Because just blasting something out there of something that you think might motivate them. But look at their behaviors. Because most of the time, what members say they want might not be uh, represented by their actions. So maybe if you take a look at your web analytics, you can see in the web analytics that they're always going to you know, particular pages to learn more about things. They're looking at your webinars. They're looking at your um, content. Um, that's a completely different subject matter from what they're telling you that they want on their email preference center. So you need to take all of these things into consideration and, um, and make them basically into one um, behavioral profile for each member so you know what motivates them. So you really need to learn the most about them from their behaviors. And their behaviors can mainly be tracked using your analytics. Both um, the metrics from your email sent, but also your web analytics if you have the ability to see 
uh, or get to their level, like if they're logging into your website, and you can see exactly what pages they're going to. Use that information um, to know what motivates them. And then also the ability. So maybe um, the ability is a um, one of your yearly uh, conventions. And the convention that you're putting on it has a particular price point. That might be uh, more difficult for them to justify at, at, at their at the point of their fiscal year, right? So you have to know a lot about them too to know when they have the ability to act on whatever motivates them. And then the trigger. Maybe it's a the trigger is a you know early bird special. Get this pricing if you register by the state. So you have to know um, what trigger behaviors would engage them the most. Okay. So now a Q4 fundraising study. So this is something that was on our last um, holiday inbox basics, an example of an email on the left. And so it's a very nicely laid out email, very simple, not a lot of text, enough graphic to, to create that emotional response. And this is the end of, um, end of the year fundraising campaign. And so it was sent to all members and prospects in their entire database. Okay, How could this be improved? All right, I like to call this improvement opportunities because I, I don't think there are uh, truly mistakes. There's just uh, opportunities for improvement. One size fits all email. Um, there's no dynamic content in here. It's not speaking to different audiences, yet it's sent to all people, okay, all prospects, all members in the, in the database. There's no personalization or customization of content at all, okay? So if this is going out, it's casting the widest net, it is casting, um, you know, the widest net from a content perspective to the widest audience. Um, and you might not, you might be hitting maybe 10% of that, and yet you're paying all this money to send out all these emails and, and getting less for it. So, um, and they're also sending the messages uh, to an unengaged audience. So if they're sending to all subscribers in their database, that's not what you want to do. Okay, so suggestions that they could have done uh, better is to customize the content for specific audiences. Be more customized in that if you have to send out multiple versions, um, then, then you can do that. If, if you want to accomplish that using dynamic content, then you can. Uh, if you know, have everyone kind of parsed out in your segmentation um, to know what to display to which segment and also suppressing non-engaged members, especially, you know, the Q4 time, it's, it's fundraising time, it's um, membership uh, conversion campaigns being sent out to the cast the widest, you know, widest net, and you need to be more, absolutely, 100% more segmented in Q4. I can't stress this enough. Okay, I'm just having a little fun here, but I, after, after all of this, I know the challenges that associations are going through right now because they have these goals. They have these conversion goals that they need to, yet they're reaching all these obstacles and you know problems coming their way because they're trying to reach their goals. Basically, um, it's making you e-moody, if you will. So you might be suffering from EMS or email message syndrome. And I've created this little infographic at the bottom here to represent the cycles of email marketing uh, throughout the year. So the top really is, uh, you know, red, it's representing summer. Um, that's when you need to be asking permission, okay? We have, uh, we recommend, send, you know, doing a permission campaign at this time, basically to re-permission people um, to ensure that you're reaching out to them because they still want to be reached out to, okay? As the cycle comes down on the right side, it's it becoming orange, it's becoming fall, okay? That is when the holiday Q4, holiday inbox, segment suppression. Segment and suppression, can't stress it enough. That goes down into winter. Now winter is an opportunity to learn. Learn from your email marketing. You can also do uh, win back campaigns um, during this time, but you need to learn about what people want, what, pe what motivates your members and your constituents, um, and how do you do that? A-B splitting is a perfect opportunity for you to learn more about what gives you that lift and response. Try out some things. Um, take a look at you know what worked in the past and then do an A-B split on that. Do certain um, 
you know, CTAs work better in the subject line? Does personalization work? Does a different color scheme for your um, call to action buttons work? All these things you can A-B split. We do have um, also some webinar assets on the High Road Solution channel on YouTube that does have some webinars, a lot of case studies and ideas for A-B split testing. So that's something that uh, we'll you know, be stressing uh, a little bit later after the holidays. And then the cycle going back up to spring. And that's really the time to engage and excite your members. So you've learned a little bit about them. You want to engage them and excite them um, at a time. Now, when you learn from what you're trying to engage people, that's when you're like, okay, well, you know, these people aren't getting engaged. What's going on? That's when you read permission. And so this cycle needs to happen every single year. Okay, and basically um, the shortcuts or takeaways, I created this recipe card for email marketing success for associations. And so um, the recipe card on here is the you know, authentication piece. It has the um, survey your constituents to see what content they value, segment and be more dynamic in your content delivery, analyze uh, email consuming behaviors, A-B test deployments, do more of what works, suppressing non-engaged from daily deployments, suppressing non-engaged before the holidays. Um, that's the important part right now for Q4. Also, motivate engaged subscribers to share your emails on the top five social, social platforms. We don't have um, a lot of customers are using the social share platform um, or the social share features inside the platform, but they're not really doing anything with it beyond that, other than just allowing their recipients to share. But what are you doing to motivate them to evangelize your brand without you having to lift a finger, without you having to send an email or, or create landing pages? I mean, really, them sharing your content on their social platform of choice where they're probably connected to a lot of like-minded individuals that may or may not already be your members, this is the ultimate referral program. So having a, you know, basically a reward program for social sharing, absolutely essential. Um, I don't know if you want to use a blueprint for this or just say, hey, we noticed you shared and have a campaign that sends an email with some, some type of offer to them to, to basically, first of all, recognize that they shared and thank them for sharing and then also motivate them to continue sharing. Like, what do they get if they keep sharing, right? That's going to motivate them to evangelize your brand even more. So um, I highly recommend that. Also, then, implementing a permission campaign uh, one to two times a year, mainly in July. Uh, you can do it again in the spring um, if you want to do it two times a year. But if you're going to only do a permission campaign one time a year, have it be um, you know, in June, July. Okay. All right, and so before we get into the Q&A portion of the webinar, so I just wanted to say that um, we at High Road l would love all associations to send a ton of email that have phenomenal open rates and leads to a ton of conversions and additional revenue. I mean, I mean, really, at the end of the day, isn't that kind of the point? Um, that's what we're all trying to achieve is the additional revenue. So we've been in the email game for so many years. We understand the cycles, and we also understand the industry, and therefore we're here to help you achieve your goals uh, with messaging your constituents. Um, so if you have you know, any questions on the recipe or you need help with your e-moodiness, uh, just let us know. So um, kind of the takeaway from all of this is to really go with the flow. And if your strategic goals as an association are going against the flow, uh, you're going to have some issues with deliverability. Um, so you can either do a couple different things. Uh, you could take into consideration these fluctuations in your yearly strategic planning meetings. Um, we want your marketing team to report open rates and recipient engagement increases during the most difficult time for marketers, right? Going with this flow and the cycle will help them do that. Um, going against it is just, it's, it's not going to give you favorable results and, and nobody's happy. And if, and if mom is not happy, nobody's happy. So go with the flow. That said, if you want help with those strategy meetings, give High Road a call. Even if you're not using one of our platforms, uh, one of our consultants, leverage, leverage them. Um, 
you know, we have the metrics, the measurable data to support every single thing we're going to advise your team on. And so I just wanted to, you know, put that out there. Even if you're not a High Road customer, uh, you know, we welcome the opportunity to work with people on a consulting basis as well because um, we've been in the email game a long time and, and uh, we're here to help. So um, thank you for participating in the pre-holiday inbox webinar. And I would like to open the floor up to any questions. Jennifer, are there any questions in the chat pod? So far, I don't see any, Jenny. But as a reminder to our attendees, to ask a question, please just go into the chat window and type in your question, and Liz will answer. I'm sorry, and Jenny will answer it. Thank you so much. All right. Obviously, if there's no questions from here, because I've um, been driving this information into you uh, with a hammer, um, then you can always, if you think of something later, you can always send an email to uh, Jenny at HighRoadSolution.com. And also, we have, I, I have a Twitter feed at HighRoadJenny. You can follow and ask any questions. Um, we'd like to use the hashtag email marketing or hashtag email chat. Okay. Let's see here. Alrighty, and Jenny, it looks like we just got a question from Kate. Um, suggestions if you have January event. Um, yes, if, if you feel free to go to um, www.highroadu.com. And all of our events and webinars, this is our new portal for the High Road U. All of our learning opportunities are there. Um, there will be webinars in January. If, if we don't have them currently on the schedule, they will absolutely be added to that portal. So feel free to register for any webinar that strikes your interest. Thanks for asking. All right. All right. And, you know, if you need campaign help, again, I'll just say that High Road, we've expanded our already large pool of resources with content developers who can work with you to craft your email campaigns for optimal engagement success. Um, we're so excited that we're, we're partnering with a lot of key people in the industry that's able to help in so many ways for, for our association customers. Um, Please do email sales at highroadsolution.com to learn more if you're interested in um, somebody, you know, content help. We have resources for that. Um, if you're interested in uh, consulting opportunities, if you want to have one of our consultants come out and talk to your team or your marketing team about their email strategy, um, certainly reach out to sales at highroadsolution.com as well. Okay, just a couple references and resources before we wrap up today's webinar. So we have um, Return Path. Return Path is our uh, value partner that helps us with um, your deliverability. And as well as two blog posts that are on our High Road Solution blog that you can reference specifically regarding Q4 info that we're talking about today, the holiday season, um, as well as recurring permission campaigns. In, I'm Jenny, oh, Jenny um, mm -hmm. oh, sorry, Katie. She, uh, Kate. She actually wanted to know what would you do for marketing an event in January? At or emailing point, for I, an event in January? Oh, emailing for an event in January. I thought you. <laughs> I apologize, Kate. Um, I thought your question was geared towards any events that we might be hosting in January. So, if you have an, an event in January that you're starting to promote now. Um, my suggestion would be at, be as segmented as you possibly can and send in smaller deployments. Smaller, uh, smaller is better, so you might want to, to you know, motivate your segments, um, motivate the recipients a different way. So you might see, okay, some people might need to um, be motivated with a, you know, you know that they're cost conscious. Their association has less resources. You might need to reach out to them with a different offer, maybe. 
uh, than you would for somebody at a larger organization that has uh, additional resources. Um, so just being more segmented and sending in smaller batches. Okay. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. If you have any additional questions, just feel free to reach out to me, Jenny, at HighRoadSolution.com. Um, thank you. Thank you for joining us at the U for Holiday Inbox Basics with Jenny Lassie from High Road Solutions. This concludes today's program. Have a great day, and you may now disconnect.